there seems to be something in our, our psyche, you know, kind of the American spiritual psyche that is constantly asking us to find the ecstatic, find like, you know, the, the holy city on the, on the hill, you know, to be part of the enlightened society. And aspects of that are great. And it's not to say you shouldn't strive for, you know, a just society and a supportive society, but it's so easy to accidentally preference all of that. And then when we get sick or we feel sad or we feel dejected or lost or rejected, that we, we lack the capability of being able to actually, you know, just experience it and rest into the wisdom of it. And then also simultaneously let it go, you know? I mean, and that's the other part of like Atta Yoga, Mahamudras, letting experience arise and, and giving it the full kind of breadth of, of experience to be able to transition into the next thing. It could dissolve into spaciousness. It could move right into some other kind of, you know, reactive um, thought activity. And even that's okay. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Lama Justin Von Boydash. Lama Justin is an American Buddhist teacher and chaplain, passionate about the preservation of the heart essence of the Tantric Buddhist tradition in a way that meets the needs of and challenges the modern Western way of life. Ordained as a Repa in the Karma Kamsang tradition of Tibetan Buddhism by His Eminence Gosher Gyatsap Rinpoche in 2011, Justin is presently the first dedicated staff chaplain for the New York City Department of Correction, where he provides spiritual support for the 13,000 employees who work throughout the New York City Correction System. He is also the author of Modern Tantric Buddhism, Embodiment and Authenticity in Dharma Practice and co-founder of Bhumi Sparsha, a Buddhist online spiritual community. So such a joy to have you here. And I wanted to jump into recent occurrences. It sounded like you were in retreat. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, both because your work is quite intense um, you have a family, like you have a full world. Uh, do you commit to an annual retreat and how does that look? Are you at home or what are you, what are you up to? If you can share any of that, maybe. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my, my life is very full, um, which is, is great. And, and I enjoy that. Um, so I was in retreat for, uh, about two months, um, I did, there, there was like a one week preparatory retreat and then two weeks off. And then uh, I went back in for seven weeks. Um, and I don't typically get like that length of time these days um, on an annual basis. Um, historically, the past several years, my retreats have been kind of accompanying a trip to India. So I'll go to India, visit with um, uh, one of my present teachers, Gautza Prabhupada who lives in Sikkim and then do retreat based on the instructions he gives every time I go see him there. Um, that being said, the COVID year was so rough, um, you know, both for, you know, within the context of the work that I do um, with uh, New York City Department of Correction, but also um, kind of a little bit more broadly, um, I, I got COVID uh, kind of in the first wave um, uh, so in April, 2020, and then upon recovering, I started, I was invited to start uh, blessing the bodies of uh, New Yorkers who died of COVID uh, as they were delivered and, and brought for burial in the um, uh, potter's field at Hart Island um, for the city. And that ended up being um, to date, probably around 2,700 bodies. And so the weight, you know, I grew up in New York, so watching New York go through everything it did was kind of, you know, intense. Supporting people both, you know, through my work as a chaplain was intense. Uh, doing this larger work kind of supporting the deceased from New York City was intense. And 
and interestingly enough, the, the retreat that I had uh, done, it was, you know, primarily <laughs> a little bit of self-care. The other piece is it was a, a way of connecting to a practice that I had been waiting about 20 years to actually formally um, connect with. Mm. Um, there was a teacher I used to study with named Patting Rinpoche in Sikkim who um, showed me this text, the, the meditation text, um, about 21 years ago and said that he would teach it if I could come back out there for a certain amount of time. I don't remember how long it was and the circumstances didn't align and he ended up passing away and I still had the text and I had showed it. It's the practice is actually from the Nyingma tradition and I practice primarily in the Kagyu tradition. And so my Kagyu teachers, when I would show it to them, were like, well, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I was really excited to be able to kind of connect to it. Um, and, you know, just personally really needed that time to kind of go deep into practice. It's helpful. Would you say anything about the practice itself? Um, I could say a little bit. It's, it's a kind of, um, uh, you know, Ati yoga practice or Zoom and Sokshan practice um, that, um, how would I say, uh, just kind of very powerful, um, you know, leads you into this, or li- led me into this experience of um, non-dual mind in a very visceral way. And and it was really helpful because a you know I'd been I'd been kind of training in some practices related to this, but then I've also been teaching Mahamudra, and had been practicing Mahamudra um, since the late '90s, um, mid to late '90s, and so it, it was a really nice kind of dovetailing uh, where kind of a lot of experiences uh, arose that that fit in really nicely with that. And I think the other really nice thing about it is like the, the practice is um, it's, it's imbued with a tremendous amount of just relax, like relaxation, like approaching meditation really gently, uh, almost, you know, maybe you could say like more intuitively than, you know, formal sessions of I'm going to sit down and do this. And, um, and I enjoy that too. It also kind of, um, kind of aligns with kind of what's happening to me kind of in the development of my practice, which is just kind of getting looser and looser and looser, which is exciting. I'm curious, just in general with Ati Yoga, do you feel like there's a naturalness to them that can be overlooked? Mm -hmm. Um, Do you find that kind of being something that's more integrated, like easily integrated into modern life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I could speak, you know, first, um, just for my work, you know, in chaplaincy. Um, actually, while I was in retreat, I found myself um, just like kind of contemplating, like, you know, at random points about how, how much I love the work, but then how um, intense it is to be ensconced within, or journeying with people in their suffering. You know? And so it could be, um, uh, you know, people who are, are um, dying or sick or, you know, really in, in kind of my work now with Department of Correction, perhaps victims of, of violence, people struggling with trauma, um, which is very different kind of in, in nature and, and kind of journeying with people who over the course of a career might be assaulted a dozen times and, you know, each, each one kind of... Uh, just hits people really um, in a strong way that 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 is concerning, and so <laughs> so I was you know resting into this experience of like very very free open spaciousness, you know, and I was like, wow, it's so weird that that's what you do for work. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe you should stop. Um, and it was actually a really fascinating thing to kind of just go there. Um, Ati yoga really has this element of, of infusing spaciousness into everything. And so, um, so for my work, I, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a uh, high impact chaplaincy in a way there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of, I'm never in charge of my schedule. So things change all the time. Um, you know, I'm, we have a large workforce, probably about 10,000 people 
and and just being available for them um, means I need to just be able to go with the flow. So it, it helps in that regard to be fluid and let go of things and not necessarily hold super tightly, um, you know, permanent ideas about myself, about the work, about, um, you know, preferences, like I wish I could sleep in or, <laughs> or do something, not go to work. Um, and I think that this is something that's really helpful for the modern human um, because we're facing so much. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll, find, especially recently, I've, I've actually very recently, I've been finding myself really concerned about what's going on in Afghanistan and uh, especially uh, what's going to happen to women and girls there. Um, I kind of politically kind of align with like a non-colonial kind of way of thinking about the world. But then at the same time, like the benefit of some of the stuff that we've done over there has benefited um, women and girls. And, and, um, and so finding myself like, you know, reacting, um, you know, emotionally reading, reading the paper or the environmental crisis, like all of this, you know, terrible heat waves and deaths associated with it and fires and floods and COVID. There's just so much, right? How the world just seems incredibly destabilized and spaciousness has this way of stabilizing things. It's like as if the container that, that holds the experience that naturally arises becomes um, open and free and things are able to arise more unimpededly without the friction of um, reactivity. You know, it's not to say I don't react, right? I, I can still be grumpy, you know, or all sorts of things. Um, but, but I think that also, you know, since there isn't necessarily a formal sadhana practice that goes along with it, uh, it, it can be done while we're, you know, having like in, doing this podcast, it can be done while walking down the street or riding the subway or walking through a jail or being, you know, on the, at the city's potter's field. Uh, just resting into the openness of whatever is arising, thought activity, emotional activity, um, sensations, you know, the way we interact with space, the way we interact with, um, with people, the way we interact with time, all of that kind of gets cracked open in a really exciting, vivid way. And I think in a way that also kind of potentially connects us back to a sense of, um, a desire to want to be here as opposed to this need to want to disassociate, which also kind of can happen a lot with Dharma practice too, where we will kind of want to go off into some pure land or recreate, you know, a lifestyle that, you know, person so-and-so may have had in 19th century Tibet or something like that. Uh, anything but here kind of thing. And, and the beautiful thing about Atta Yoga is it really is like, well, there's nothing but here. So, you know, we might as well, you know, just embrace it. Because you deal with such intense uh, emotions, like you're in crisis situations all the time. Can you give us like a, a feel of what are kind of typical crises that you have no uh, control over, like time-wise when they happen and how you in that space allow yourself to be a vessel of wisdom and sanity for yourself? Like how do you mm -hmm. maintain self-care? Yeah, these moments as well as be wisdom, you know, a space of wisdom and compassion for these people. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, like with my present work, you know, I mean, one really good example would be um, when when people die. So it could either be people in custody. So, people, you know, people who are detainees in our jails or um, or staff. And, uh, you know, I usually get a phone call. It's, you know, for some reason, usually always at night. Um, and so, you know, I'll get the call and need to just kind of jump right into um, a mode of response. Um, depending on the situation, I'll have to go actually respond um, to the situation, which could either mean engaging with family, it could be engaging colleagues, work colleagues, uh, could be, you know, on, you know, within one of our facilities. Um, 
And I think that the, the thing that I, I kind of always go to in the beginning is the call will come, I'll take down whatever pertinent information I need, uh, figure out where it is that I need to go. And as I'm driving there, um, check in to see really what is going on, you know, in a, in a way like our bodies are a really powerful kind of weather vein, which, uh, so, you know, the feeling in my chest, relative tightness or anxiety there in my belly. Uh, I'll be tired often if it's, you know, I've woken up in the middle of the night, but at the same time, I'll be aware of the uh, adrenaline, perhaps like kind of coursing through my system, making me feel like a super person. Um, arriving at the scene of wherever this, this situation is, um, you know, a scene of, of, pain and loss and depending on who's there the you know the reactivity of the you know the colleagues or loved ones of, of whoever um and trying to remain attuned to what is coming up for them simultaneously remaining aware of what's coming up for me in that moment seeing seeing the grief um you know there have been times where i've had to tell um the parents of adult uniformed correction officers who have died that their loved one has died. And to hear mothers scream and yell and shout and bargain with God or the cosmos about, you know, why, you know, why now? Why did you take my loved one? Um, to then talk with staff who are just heartbroken and stuck in an experience of loss that's profound while they do work that is exceptionally challenging, traumatizing, exhausting, et cetera, you know, kind of feels very low. And so, you know, remaining open to all of the feeling is really important and powerful. And, and the best way to do that is to be able to kind of maintain a sense of spacious awareness of what's coming. And then there's a, you know, this kind of, um, I mean, it's a little, it's, it's gonna sound strange. It's a little bit like cooking where like, you know, you're watching the process unfold as you're, as you're uh, impacting the circumstances through the words that I say, the presence that I give, um, the words that I don't say you know, the emphasis that I might place on, on trying to kind of uh, maybe move someone in a particular direction towards connecting more to their emotions, right? When they want to really like hold, hold a real kind of together kind of um, response. Um, and, and that is, that makes the whole experience also very intimate. Um, and then, you know, and then afterwards, after, you know, the interaction is, is finished, um, the resulting kind of, I guess, what would you say? Um, the reflection of just, of what I've just gone through with, you know, whoever it is, uh, is powerful and connective and empathy creating um, you can't really do this kind of work and be open without feeling a lot and feeling a lot of connecting uh, kind of energy uh, with the person that you're with uh, or the people that you're, you're with. And so um, I might find myself feeling sad or uh, wanting to cry, you know, as I drive home or drive you know, back to work um, if it happens during the work day. Um, and, you know, there's also another part of me that, that tries to maintain a sense of bearing witness to the pain and the suffering. I think that there's this really kind of innate part of being human that wants to, to, to push all of that stuff away. And I understand that I've been in all sorts of painful situations myself where, you know, it's like, of course, I'd prefer not to go through this. And yet, to almost be like a historian or somebody who maintains the chronicles of pain uh, or the chronicles of loss or the chronicles of death is important because there's wisdom in that as well. You know, there's wisdom in being, you know, for the work I've been doing at, at Heart Island, there's wisdom. And I actually say this as I bless the bodies that, you know, I, I see you, 
you know, I like see uh, you as you're being, you know, brought into the earth, uh, you're not forgotten, you know, and just holding, um, holding the, the kind of holding space for people who are forgotten, you know, who are buried. Um, it's really vital work. And then of course, you know, as, as like a hum, human Dharma practitioner, then, you know, there's also power in, in just kind of coming back to the, the constancy of impermanence and death and suffering and loss. And not because I'm a depressive <laughs> or, or, you know, some kind of glutton for punishment, but just because, you know, there's something very innate about, about forgetting that and wanting this great experience to keep going and keep going and keep going. And uh, it won't, you know, and, and, and because it won't, also, though, somehow mysteriously makes, at least for me, appreciate every little moment that happens. You know, I'm a parent, so I've got kids, and um, to appreciate them where they're at in their development, you know, that that's always changing. Um, you know, my relationship with my wife, uh, my relationship with my family, colleagues, friends, Dharma students, et cetera it's just always changing. And um, so the work is really helpful and, and kind of just, you know, remembering that these basic Dharma points about, uh, you know, karma and permanence, death, um, never loses its power. And are you, are you with people right now? I know before you were doing hospice care, mm -hmm. some of these inmates or the um, staff, are you, with them as they're dying? Or are you mainly arriving um, after somebody has passed? It's, it's usually after people have passed. Um, um, yeah, with hospice though, uh, which is what I did prior. Yeah, I, I would be with people usually when they were actively dying. Um, and, and, then, and then prior to that, with hospice, theoretically, people should come on with about six months uh, to die, like best case kind of scenario. And, and the really nice thing about that is journeying with people as they have the opportunity to kind of um, like wrap up their, their life, which I've, I've actually done with uh, my root Dharma teacher, uh, uh, Anizamo. I, I wrote about that in Modern Tantric Buddhism. Um, and even a little bit with Patung Rinpoche, I was with him for the last two weeks before his, his death in Sikkim. Um, but it is such an extraordinary opportunity to, I mean, I've, I've had people tell me all sorts of amazing things of, of like, um, you know, people in their seventies who are at the end of life, uh, you know, recounting their first um, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend and just how, you know, and how, like, you know, when they were like 16 and uh, like in the fifties and how like, incredibly alive they felt and you know what an amazing thing to just kind of like go back and think about all of the experiences we've had good bad and and you know in between uh and it's almost as if like we're kind of like acknowledging coming back to the feeling and then letting them go and it just you know um sometimes we forget how rich our life has been you know, even when we're at this point where, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting. Are you, when you're with them, because you're, were you more Buddhist? I know you trained with the, with the New York Zen contemplative mm -hmm. care. So you're going more from the Buddhist perspective of death and dying. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, I can't, I can't escape that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I'm just curious. So, so when you're with somebody that's dying, and I know it's not what you're currently doing, but you're so yeah. in the field, right? You've kind of now, now fully in every aspect of somebody's dying process, mm -hmm. like six months before to them being, you know, put into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, what are, like, what are the thoughts going through your mind for them as they're actually transitioning? Are you doing particular practices? Or are you just having a particular state of being? Like, how do you keep company with somebody that's in those last minutes. I'm just thinking of people that would be listening that are in totally. this right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, um, I don't do like formal practices. Um, I used to like, you know, when I was training as a chaplain, uh, I had this great experience with, with a Tibetan family who had a child that had 
fallen and had a subdural hematoma and they, you know, the medical staff thought that the child would die. And the family actually didn't know that much about Vajrayana, but they identified culturally as, as kind of Adriana people. And I got to do, you know, medicine, Buddha and Tara and chill for them, and, you know, in the hospital. And that was pretty cool. Um, these days, and I think this is kind of where, like, I think Mahamudra and Ati Yoga kind of kinds of practices are really powerful um, around death and dying. There's, there's so much to be said for holding space and maintaining an open, responsive, um, spacious presence. And, you know, I, I like to tell people that we could probably all name one or two or three or a handful of people we've met in our lives or just being with them or, you know, having a quiet day, you know, making eye contact, connecting, maybe sitting in silence, uh, just felt so amazing and alive and fulfilling and reassuring. And so that's, that's what I try and um, practice into. Also, because I am not that, I don't really like talking about my particular faith. So it's, if somebody asks, you know, maybe I'll self-disclose. Um, and so I'm really there to help the other person um, manifest and experience what's coming up to provide support, you know, maybe tangible support if, if that's what's really needed. But even then, you know, I think the Christian tradition, Jewish tradition, Muslim tradition, Hindu tradition, you know, most traditions have a, you could say that there's like an essence aspect of them as well. There's like compassion, love, uh, generosity. Everybody wants peace. Everybody, um, Everybody wants to know, especially if you're dying, that your loved ones are going to be okay. I think also everybody wants to be remembered, you know. Um, everybody wants to be remembered fondly. <laughs> um, and I think also, you know, there, there can be, I've, I've seen it a number of times, this desire to want to forgive for perhaps old grudges or situations where you feel that you may have been misunderstood and just holding that kind of, you know, very non-judgmental space, spacious presence to allow people to share whatever it is, almost like a confession, um, you know, speaking it out into space so that it, it no longer terrifies or it no longer kind of possesses the person um, in that way. And then kind of more tangibly, um, I remember asking, I, I used to study with Boko Rinpoche, uh, who died um, in 2004. And I asked the abbot of his monastery, Kempo Lodrodonio, a few years afterwards, what he thought the best practice to do for people who were dying was. And um, uh, Boko Rinpoche and then he as well are, are both these great Mahamudra practitioners. And he said that just resting into the nature of mind sitting next to or being directly in relationship to somebody is so powerful with respect to how it, it, it kind of changes the environment and allows the person who is dying or who has just died to kind of also ease into that state as well. And I think we forget the impact we can have in just being there. And it's funny, I and mean, I don't know how this is going to sound, but I watched that documentary about mushrooms um, uh, last night. Um, and it's something like, you know, the incredible world of mushrooms or something like that. Or, um, but, but it really got into like the, the, um, the underground networks of fungi that connect trees and the trees will communicate through them and actually pass nutrients to one another through these mycelium kind of networks underground and, and, you know, it just kind of led me to think that so many things are much more interconnected than we tend to assume, including us, right? And so when, when there is somebody who is dying or who has just died, and the retreat I just did, like, had a component of kind of going through the bardo, uh, you know, over this course of 49 days, 
uh, in it. And so there, there was a, this experience of increasing subtlety of mind, increasing subtlety of experience leading to this, like, you know, what is supposed to happen after death, after one passes through the bardo of this kind of, you know, Vajra mind like experience. And, and it's led me to, it's confirmed for me, perhaps, I guess you could say the fact that um, there are many ways which we can be positively and negatively, you know, impacted in this place of interdependence right at the moment of death or leading up to the moment of death. And then, and then for, you know, a certain amount of time afterwards. Will you speak more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, once there's less, as, as the kind of, you know, preoccupation with physical body, uh, and relative emotional experience begins to wane you know, post-death, um, there is still this incredibly sensitive awareness present. And it is present to, uh, or present for um, those who we've left behind, you know, those who are still alive. And so you find like in the literature, um, uh, these stories of delogs, you know, these people who have died uh, and uh, gone through the bardo only to be told that they should actually come back. It's kind of like a near-death experience. And there's actually a genre of literature of these stories. And, and they're very fascinating because they're all kind of very similar in the sense that the person has this death experience. They increase, they experience this increase in subtlety. They, they kind of die and then are aware of everybody in the room. And there are some very funny stories where, where you know, the person who has come back recounts the fact that uncle so-and-so was there and was talking about how they were going to get, um, you know, take their, their land, you know, and it made the consciousness all, you know, upset. Uh, or somebody who was really nasty was kind of like, you know, shedding crocodile tears, but, you know, oh, it's so sad, so and so. And, um, and, you know, we forget, I think just because we tend to be pretty obsessed with the materialist worldview that post-death, there is this kind of remainder, so to speak, that's not a soul, but, but a remainder kind of awareness or consciousness that is um, attuned to the reactions of those we love, the reactions of those with whom perhaps we have a difficult relationship what happens to our body. And, and that thing though, that, that, that awareness becomes increasingly subtle until it's able to just rest into the nature of phenomenon itself. And at that point, it's kind of just like moved on. And, and this is a place where if we have the opportunity to recognize the nature of mind, then this becomes extremely transformative uh, and, you know, can lead to, you know, awakening in the bardo. Um, and so practicing now, you know, in our, our regular, you know, ordinary state, uh, especially these practices that, that push us to um, increase our awareness practices to really kind of unfold and unpack some of this interdependence between all of us really can become a tremendous benefit for us when we die. And then of course, for us as caregivers um, or for us as um, people who will love, lose loved ones, you know, to um, perhaps be mindful of the environment around somebody we love who has died. You know, to be able to, um, the one thing, one, one of these takeaways from my retreat was this um, appreciation for how, how in so many cultures, there's this practice of um, leaving food offerings for the deceased. Because I actually went through like, it's probably like 48 hours of feeling like hyper aware of the fact that I was being left behind in this kind of retreat experience. And there is, a, it was very odd. There's like, I really wanted to be remembered, you know? And then it made me, you know, kind of recall how like, and you know, if you go to like the Chinese Buddhist temples, uh, you know, in, in New York, 
uh, and, and you look and there are all the pictures of everybody who's died and then the food offerings there, right? Or in, you know, Day of the Dead uh, or, or um, you know, in ancient Egypt, they would, they would bury people with food. Um, and to forget that it's not just putting someone in the ground and then the grieving process, right? We could still offer love, we could still offer generosity. And that's also a really helpful piece of the grieving process as well, is to maintain connection. Um, and then there's this question of like, you know, what does it mean to maintain connection with people after all of this time, you know, that they may have died? And I feel like I've had some opportunity to be able to kind of explore that with my teachers who have died on his own well, Padre Rinpoche, Boko Rinpoche in particular. Um, and to understand, at first I felt left behind, I felt lonely, I felt um, sad. You know, there's this narrative of, oh my gosh, now I'm all alone, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, then, and then now though, it's really kind of um, that I can feel them. I can feel, I can feel, almost even the, you know, the quality of their presence as far as the manifestation of their personality. You know, I, mean, I don't know how that sounds, but you know, that's, that's what I feel now. And so it's, it's important to remember that um, we're not alone and that maybe there's like a little bit of um, kind of the, the imprint of this materialist worldview that makes us feel separated, makes us feel distant, which might not be true. Mm -hmm. Will you share about, I wrote this um, quote that you wrote um, from Ani Zangmo. You said, long before Ani Zangmo died, she told me that she wished that I would have the opportunity to experience a long and painful life. Yes. And you know, of, co of course, for many, this would seem like a cruel blessing. Um, but can you speak to the gift that this was? I mean, because just for me, when I when I read that, I felt the relief. Yeah. Well, to, to the point you just brought up, I mean, like social media is really intense in the sense that uh, if we're not having the best day ever, every day, <laughs> like, you know, there's something wrong with us, um, which is, which I mean, I, I'm sure like the negative impact of that is, is pretty significant, you know, over time um, with, with, it, I still remember really clearly that conversation that, that um, she and I had and when she brought that up and, um, you know, she had given the empowerment and teachings on the practice of Chinrezi around that time. And that was already really like kind of, um, you know, non-conventional to have this, you know, none like, you know, given empowerment, and, you know, teach this practice and all of that. Um, but she was she was taught she was teaching about how um, how amazing it is that over the course of all of our successive lives, we have committed the worst crimes. We have hurt everybody in the worst imaginable imaginable ways. We have loved people in the most amazing ways. We have done everything from you know the worst to the best, the highest to the lowest, and now we find ourselves you know here wherever we are. And that, A, that history of n having the range of experience, even if we don't remember, connects us to everybody around us, whether or not it's somebody who's committed the worst crime or hurt somebody very badly, um, to somebody whose virtue and uh, humility, for example, is just like overwhelming. Um, and, and yet, you know, as we continue in work to be present with people and um, perhaps even just to be present with ourselves and our practice, the more hardship we experience, the more pain, the more fear, the more loss, the more frustration, to be actually present for that, you know, for samsara gives us the ability to be able to be present for other people as they journey through samsara as well. And, you know, so it's a little bit like, you know, putting that oxygen mask on ourselves first when we find ourselves like, you know, really unhappy 
really tense, really irritable, really frustrated, really depressed, really weak, really impotent, really um, challenged. It's, if we engage in a practice that is dissociative where we're not really feeling, we're not letting ourselves be present, we're not finding the wisdom in, um, you know, with, with her, you know, she was, um, she was quite sick. And so we spent a lot of time um, with her feeling sick and weak, um, laying on, like laying on a couch, maybe me sitting on the floor by her or sitting on another part of the couch um, and just talking, you know, and then her saying, okay, I don't feel well. Like I'm going to roll over and go to sleep, take a nap when I go for a walk, you know, and then I would come back and you know, we would sit in ordinariness. And I think that there is this pressure these days to manifest the extraordinary all the time. And a, a bias towards peace, a bias towards love, a bias towards, <laughs> you know, life affirming things. And through her, I've really been able to kind of let if I if we could say I have a ministry of any kind it's a ministry of death <laughs> a ministry of you know sadness and heartbreak and loss and it sounds dramatic but um but to be present and open to those allows me also to kind of connect to these kinds of beings like Paul de Lamo you know, these protectors that are just like the kinds of people you don't want to hang out with because they're scary. <laughs> they're intense. Um, life is intense, you know, and if I am going to get so wrapped up in transforming, 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 transforming everything, uh, I'm going to forget and not be able to see or appreciate pain and loss and sorrow and ordinariness. And brokenness and, and all sorts of things. Um, and I think maybe for us, particularly, I know that you're in the UK right now and you're you know born in the United States. So I didn't, you know, as an American, perhaps um, there seems to be something in our, our psyche, you know, kind of the American spiritual psyche that is constantly asking us to find the ecstatic find like you know the the holy city on the on the hill you know to be part of the enlightened society and aspects of that are great and it's not to say you shouldn't strive for you know a just society and a supportive society but it's so easy to accidentally preference all of that and then when we get sick or we feel sad or we feel dejected or lost or rejected that we, we lack the capability of being able to actually, you know, just experience it and rest into the wisdom of it. And then also simultaneously let it go, you know? I mean, and that's the other part of like Ati Yoga, Mahamudra is letting experience arise and, and giving it the full kind of breadth of, of experience to be able to transition into the next thing it could dissolve into spaciousness it could move right into some other kind of you know reactive um thought activity and even that's okay so coming to the realm of bypassing you know mm -hmm. spiritual bypassing and injustice bypassing mm -hmm. how does one work with the resistance from others the divisions that that creates when we actually speak up what are your thoughts on just individually, like how, how we can each really ground into what we feel is right and not be taken over by the fear of being ostracized, essentially? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it's funny in the sense that, um, you know, my, my wife was uh, telling me uh, two weekends ago, she, you know, it was just kind of like random to kind of caught me off guard. She's like, uh, I, I love how, um, <laughs> I'm gonna curse. She said, you know, I love how you don't give a fuck about things. And I don't think of myself that way. So, you know, I it it, it really cracked me up. Um but I think there's something in that, right? Is is um, you know, especially in spiritual communities, um spiritual communities tend to be and, and sometimes it's good, right? Conflict averse. Um and you know, when when 
uh, when we look at like, you know, in Vajrayana Sanghas, there are specific samayas about not creating division in, in Sangha and all of that. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't stand up for people, right? And stand up for, for injustice, um, white supremacy, patriarchy, all of these things, um, you know, trying to counter whiteness, uh, speak up for diversity. Um, you know, I think it's really important to remember that doing these things, speaking up to, to um, confront and disrupt racism and sexism and patriarchy in, in the Dharma world is practice. And, you know, I, I totally get that it will make people uncomfortable. Uh, it will make teachers uncomfortable. And I've, I've spoken with, with a number of people who, who have really irked their kind of, you know, traditional Tibetan teachers, you know, who are like, oh, well, like, you know, this is an American problem. This isn't you know, all beings are essentially equal anyway. So like, you know, why are you kind of engaging in creating all this division and difference by emphasizing the, you know, the protection of people who feel that they're um, not being respected. And we have to do what's right, you know? And so sometimes that means we might, um, be at odds with, you know, maybe, you know, the administration of a Sangha or particular Sangha members or the Lama or Rinpoche, if it's Tibetan or Roshi or whatever, if it's Zen. Um, and that's okay, right? I mean, like the manifestation of compassion, especially compassion in act action, like embodied compassion, necessarily means shining a light where sometimes we we might not be able to see that a light needs to be shined upon or another person you know a, the kind of vajra brother or sister or or a teacher you know and if that's inconvenient <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> you know i mean at some point right like we're the one you're you're going to die i'm going to die and if we let our fear prevent us from speaking up and trying to better Dharma communities or to better the world around us, to reduce the suffering of others, to help perhaps, um, I know this term might be a little triggering, but like call out power, mm -hmm. right? And call out kind of blind power. Um, or misuse of power, then, then really what are, what are we doing? You know, and it's not to say that Dharma practices only social justice, but it's also not to say that you, you know, the justice aspect of that, right? That being able to be a just and loving support for others isn't part of Dharma, right? That is. And yes, everything is inherently empty <laughs> um, and non-dual and blissful, right? But, um, but so many of these problems are so unconscious, which is why sometimes they need to very consciously be exposed, uh, examined, and, you know, critically analyzed. And I, I think that's the, the other piece is, um, uh, I, make, I was gonna make a joke, but like the different, different like lineages and their relationship to critical analysis. And, you know, I practice like, you know, Kagyu Nyingma and theoretically we're not that into like, you know, analyzing things like, you know, emptiness and all that stuff. It's practice, right? Um, and, and yet it's really important. It's like for, for me, for example, as, a, as like a white man to um, remain critical of how easy everything can be sometimes, you know, both in the Dharma setting uh, because I think a lot of whiteness has been absorbed into and white supremacy to some extent, you know, absorbed right into Vajrayana Sanghas without people necessarily recognizing it. Um, and so for me to remain kind of aware of how easy things have been helps me to kind of also counter that narrative around like, oh gosh, you know, I'm just so blessed. <laughs> you know, I've got such, um, uh, you know, such merit, you know, um, 
and you know if again some people have a problem with it and i and I, you know i can intellectually understand where they're coming from and it's i i don't mean to hurt but you know the truth hurts sometimes there is also a tendency to for people to not want to engage in activity that disturbs the minds of others so that's what that's what they'll say <laughs> and of course like you know um the danger of that of course is is that uh, even even just like you know if we're really going to be honest with ourselves and it doesn't have to be within the context of you know race and gender and all that but but if i you know recognize that i can be hypocritical which i can like right we're all human we're all you know um pretty imperfect um that critical analysis is <laughs> like you know it's intense right it's a reminder of like oh boy okay like um and so that disturbs my mind right but that disturbs my mind in a good way right in the sense of like okay i need to actually confront this i need to perhaps be a little bit more patient be more diligent be more aware and you know usually in group settings when people say well well you know you really shouldn't say anything that upsets other people right like what <laughs> what does that lead to right like um and for the person who might feel when they look around like a sangha and they don't see anybody who looks like them right or when it it feels like we're expected to let wholesale adopt tibetan culture and therefore everything we have lived from infancy until you know coming to dharma is just this like you know mundane you know meaningless thing and now i've come to dharma and now my life is meaningful kind of thing um like these things need to be confronted you know um it's and it's not because we're jerks <laughs> it's because uh, you, you know again coming back to this kind of the, like the larger view that you find in mahamudra and sokshan is everything is inherently free and open and arises perfectly even the fact that you know we may not have been born into a buddhist household we may not have may not identify as culturally buddhist or anything like that um that we may look different we may sound different we may not you know speak the same way we might not inflect things the same way um and and i think this is the big kind of learning that you know in the west where we're going to have to go through you know over the next couple of centuries just to really understand what an indigenous uh, western dharma or like in the like kind of the circles i kind of exist in um an indigenous western vajrayana buddhism looks like um and hopefully it looks awesome and full of color and life and and energy um and looks like the people that are practicing it. Yeah, I'd be very curious to see that, especially all the different rituals and practices to see them transformed into each person's particular culture. Yeah, yeah. And there's so many people who are not interested in that <laughs> and, you know, see that as um, a, you know, a, a kind of pollution of the purity of Dharma. And, and yet, you know, the same people will maybe like jazz or hip hop or these different kinds of art forms that are based on appropriation, right? Like this constant play and experimentation. Um, and it's ironic that, you know, on one, one side of your life, you could love all of that, like appropriation, experimentation, constant creativity. But when it comes to Dharma practice, it has to be, because it's not what Pacho Rinpoche did or if it's not what Jumpkin Kantra Lodjotai did, you know, then it's, it's, you know, um, it lacks power, mm. it lacks efficacy. I mean, it's so absurd. Can you speak on this around the connection with the Vajrayana tradition? Because these peoples, I mean, the Tibetan culture, there's been genocide, right, on, on these populations, that there's such an intense adherence to tradition and preservation. Can you speak a little bit about that? Because I think it's like, it's definitely something I haven't really 
connected with like maybe how there's a really uh, traumatized adherence to it. Um, and, and just how you foresee maintaining the potency of these teachings that I think, you know, many of us deeply appreciate without watering it down, but allowing it to transform, you know, out of yeah. this era. So, so the point you brought up, uh, yeah, I, I really love. Um, my, my family is relatively new in the United States in the sense that um, both my gr- grandparents on my mother's side and my father's side um, emigrated to North America from um, essentially from Hungary. And why this is interesting to me is because there was such a long time where I felt like, you know, I don't even understand, like I didn't connect to that. And I actually thought it was a little weird that like, you know, my family, like my, my father came to the U S and in, in the sixties from Australia, his family had come to Australia from Hungary. And on my mother's side, everyone came directly from, hungry my, my grandparents and I grew up encountering these these elderly Hungarians who were just like very resentful about being in America They're, you know they'd speak Hungarian the only food they would eat was Hungarian they really didn't like being here but they certainly didn't want to go back <laughs> and they were just really intense and then you cut to like you know later as as like a young adult I'm connecting to Vajrayana Buddhism and then you meet all these monks <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're exactly the same way, right? And and you learn about their stories, and their stories are like they're so intense. You know the you know what it what it must have been like to be a, a you know a, a young boy, in some cases young girl, as and flee Tibet and completely lose track of your extended family, or to know that your extended family had been killed if you were ordained to know that there was a very good likelihood that your monastery was destroyed to go to India, which, um, you know, was able to receive them, but they're really, you know, I mean, the Tibetan resettlement camps in in India, when a lot of people first ended up going to them, they were usually just rough patches of jungle that were given to them. And so they had to, um, uh, cultivate the land, they had to build communities, they had to come up with, you know, kind of community associations. Um, And then emigrating to the US, there's a lot of preservation of culture that was, you know, perhaps you could say equally important as the preservation of Dharma. Mm -hmm. And it happened at this time where Americans were like freaking out about like, their parents and grandparents and we're like, oh, I want to live something different. It was like this perfect storm is so strange. And I tend to wonder how many of these uh, teachers have experienced, I mean, they have experienced trauma. Like you read the narrative, you know, arc of a lot of lives of folks, Trungpa Rinpoche, Kempa Karta Rinpoche, uh, uh, Chagatulku, um, you know, a lot of the, the big teachers, you know, who remained in Asia, but would still travel here. Same thing, you know, lose so many family, um, friends. And to this day are still kind of weathering these waves of, of loosening of relationship to Vajrayana in Tibet and then tightening, you know, the, the allowance of building, you know, monasteries and then clamping down on them and all, you know, all this stuff. And so sometimes I think that there, there is, a, you know, kind of a, a sense of non-connection between a lot of Vajrayana, like Western Vajrayana students come and they want to learn Dharma authentically. And a lot of teachers are, don't want to necessarily give the whole thing up because they feel like it needs to be preserved exactly the way it was in this monastic fashion. And I can understand, you know, again, both, both sides of this. And I, don't, I really don't, for me, it's not a criticism of, of either side. But it's clear sometimes that either side is not listening to the other. You know, I think it's clear that sometimes people don't re- really recognize the trauma and sadness that a lot of, you know, these Tibetan teachers feel. Um, I have met with, with a lot of teachers in Asia and have kind of in private heard stories about how painful things have been for them. And then I've, I've met 
um, I'm with a lot of monks, you know, my age or slightly older who are like, you know, at some point in our relationship would get very angry with me and because they're like, well, you get to go back to America to your family and I'm stuck here and I didn't ask for this. And meanwhile, I'm like, oh my God, you're like the attendant of so-and-so Rinpoche. Like I would give my arm to have one week of yours. And, um, you know, it's kind of as if there are two different kinds of ways of appreciating life. Um, and it, it's, help, it's helpful for me to kind of be very clear about what I am seeking. Like I'm not seeking a disassociation from my Western life. So I don't walk around wearing Tibet clothes. Uh, and even my teachers, you know, I used to ask, because I, I didn't really know Tibetan well. And um, I asked Bokram Chay and he was like, oh, you know, what's the point? Most of these things have been translated into English. And then I asked Gelsa Brimpche and he told me like, why learn another form of suffering? <laughs> and so that last instruction, I was like, okay, like that was amazing. And I can be me. Like, and, and that is the really powerful thing is to be able to be ourselves freely and to practice Dharma. And to, to, you know, have a deep appreciation of the development of the lineage and a deep appreciation for the tradition and to uphold it, but to be me, you know, to not be some, you know, person who's, you know, walking around acting. And I think that that also ends up being kind of, you know, the positive form of appropriation where um, I have been able to be blessed by my teachers to be asked to be creative and how this whole thing comes together. And, um, but at the same time, I've also been with and spent a lot of time counseling people who have never had that opportunity and who are struggling to either extricate themselves from a deep unhappiness that's arisen as a result of kind of uh, taking all the culture and realizing at some point that actually this, I don't even want this, or there's no room for me in it, I have to be somebody else. And so then there's this element of kind of having to work with people around getting free within their Dharma practice. And then even then, we're re-examining their Dharma practice to find the energy in it. And then the beautiful thing about Tantra is it's all energy, right? And, but we kind of need to let go of a lot of our hang-ups and a lot of our projections in order to be able to find that energy, to experience that energy, and then to live it in a way that's you know, authentic. I totally agree. I really, I feel energized by just the inquiry of this, this yeah. what you're sharing right now. And it brings to mind the, the question of then what is, this feels very tied to maybe the possibility that there's some uh, modern Mahasiddha like there's some this just feels like this is kind of what it's moving towards what you're sharing is this because yeah. there were these people right that were like totally outrageous and everybody I mean thought like some people hated them and they mm -hmm. did all the worst possible things and you would never invite them into your house if your mind wasn't vast and I don't know clear um, and where where is that now in 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 dharma in these traditions and how can we it's kind of what you were saying like where your wife's like you know you just don't give a fuck it's like how can we yeah just not care so much you know maintaining that thread of wisdom but just risk more and be more inventive in dharma i just yeah i think like that's the life that i'm feeling you share about curious your thoughts around that yeah, thank you. And I mean, now I'm getting all energized, <laughs> like thinking, because I mean, this is this is the thing that like, um, uh, I'm really excited about um, is, is that model here. Um, and it's not to say, and I think I, I don't mean to say we need to be careful in the sense of, oh, you need to be careful, you shouldn't pretend you're a Mahasiddha. But, um, but I think it's a little bit like abstract painting, right? Like you can go to a museum or a gallery or somebody's studio and you see it and you're like, oh, well, that's not that hard. You know, I could just do that. And my dad's a painter and, you know, like, so he, there's abstract painting all over the, the, the place. And I'd grow up going to museums thinking, oh, this is, this, you know, 
this is cool. There's a lot of energy in it. And I you know how hard could it be? And then, and then you get into the, 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 the practice of painting and you realize that there's, that it's not so easy. However, it doesn't mean it's unapproachable. And I think that this, there is a, like, if we could have the union of free and open being with Dharma practice, this will naturally happen. But the free and open being piece is really ultimately born out of deeply confronting and disrupting our kind of um, blind spots. We still have them, right? But deeply confronting them, deeply confronting like our projections about what Dharma should be. And, you know, again, kind of really moving into these awareness practices of embracing life, embracing the world around us, embracing the world within us and, and not holding back. And I think that, you know, we, we'll, sometimes we'll meet people like the Dalai Lama whose compassion is just so incredible and moving and just, you feel it, right? He doesn't hold back, right? He's not like, oh, I need to like conserve my energy, right? And so then it becomes this kind of, you know, thing, and I think this is also closely related is this idea of conserving energy is a little weird. There is constant energy everywhere happening, happening, happening. And when we can kind of, you know, touch into this, it's a little bit like that, that network of mycelium I was talking about before, like this interconnectedness that like we can't, everything is okay. Everything is pure. We don't need to worry about whether or not <laughs> we should dress Tibetan or dress anyway. You know, we don't, we, you know, the more we experience death and have energy around the death experience and loss and pain and suffering, the more we're able to, and it's not even navigate it, the more we're able to be at home with it. And so it's not a big deal. In, in modern tantric Buddhism, there's this wonderful um, song that a friend of mine translated by Padampa Sangye who's, you know, the progenitor of the CJ tradition, which influenced Machi Glibshan and the Chit tradition. And, and, and in it, like, there are these great lines where, you know, death is a treasury of bliss. Suffering is a treasury of bliss. Illness is a treasury of bliss. And they are. And if we can just begin to, you know, trust into that, to smile into that, to laugh into that, to laugh at our, like, you know, <laughs> at our smallness, and relationship to death and loss and fear and anxiety, um, the more we move in that direction. And I think that, you know, really, um, when we have Western siddhas running around, you know, female and male, that's when we're going to know, you know, okay, like this is, you know, this is, uh, this is it. You know, this, this tradition has all the power, you know, in the universe and, and it's here too, and we don't need to worry. You know, Ani Zangma once said, um, she, she wrote, she, I have a couple of letters that she wrote early on. They're so beautiful. And apparently like my last year of college, she wrote another one, which was um, lost in the mail. And she had said, um, oh, you know, that letter had the only instruction you would ever need and you would have never had to come back to India you know, if, if you would have received it, but I got lost in the mail. So now you need to go the whole path, <laughs> you know, from point A to point B or point Z. And, um, and, you know, I think that soon we will be able to have Dharma lineages that are indigenous, where we are, where those fundamental teachings are able to be able to be transmitted. Um, I, I also don't really think it's, it's that far-fetched or that far in the future. And yeah, a lot of people aren't going to be into it, but you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Just to end our conversation to the, today on a very, you know, um, blissful topic, mm -hmm. what, what, what could we do? What would be something we could do during the day to just remind ourselves of our death of impermanence to get ourselves really able to smile at it and uh, rejoice in it. Yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, you know, one thing you could do is um, 
is be dead. You know, pretend you're dead. You know, lay down or sit down and allow yourself to just die, mm -hmm. you know, and, and see what that's like, see what comes up, you know, see what fears arise, um, you know, try and make this experience of, of kind of feigning your own death um, be as real as possible. Mm -hmm. um, let your thought activities die. You know, let every activity you do, once you stop it, that's death. Um, You know, speak to old people. You know, America is such a weird place, right? We, we, we like to hide the elderly. <laughs> we like to hide, you know, aging. Everything is like, you know, you know, hide your wrinkles or iron your face or <laughs> stuff like that. Like, you know, um, get old. You know, bring some of your imperfections out into into the world. Um, you know, show your, your big belly, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that's happening, you know, in, in that quote unquote unattractive aging way, mm -hmm. rejoice in it. Um, like really invite, invite imperfection. And I think really like, you know, if we're really going to make it tantric, then we should just invite everything that's inauspicious, invite bad luck, um, you know, invite dirtiness you know, invite nastiness and let it show up. And, you know, like, like birds, so you're feeding birds, like feed, feed all of your worst qualities, you know, um, and then see what's really there, you know, and, and, and like this kind of constant returning to recognizing what is actually there is the thing that begins to move us towards this freedom and this acceptance and this ability to let the worst arise and for there to be spaciousness in that. Mm. You know, like throw, you know, dirt on your altar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just do, do all the most inappropriate things you can. Um, and, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs>